open up your custom gold bug boxes. Watch. Mine's full of poo. Thankfully, we have another banger from Mike Flanagan who brought us such classics as The Haunting of Hill House and Midnight Mass. There's a lot to cover here, including who Verna actually is, which, by the way, her name is an anagram for Raven, the fate of the Usher family, and how Luke Skywalker fits into all this. That's impossible! But before we begin, make sure to like and subscribe, or I'll have to go back to my old job where I was treated like this. Tina! My name isn't Tina, you know that my name is Beth. I don't give a shit, Beth! The fall of the House of Usher revolves around head of the Usher family and president of Fortunato Pharmaceuticals, Roderick Usher. It's interesting to note that Frank Langella, Langella was originally cast as Roderick, but had to be fired due to misconduct allegations. Thus, all his scenes were reshot. Bruce Greenwood then came in to fill the role, who I thought did a phenomenal job. And he's been in past Flanagan works, such as Gerald's Game. We can even see Gerald's Game on the TV in the background in episode 6 as a fun little Easter egg. Now we're talking. Roderick has summoned assistant DA August Dupin, a detective character found in Edgar Allan Poe's short stories, to confess all his crimes. This comes in the wake of the death of his six children. Yes, in the past week, the dude has lost all six of his children, each in unusual and gruesome ways. But to understand how we got here, we must travel back to 1953. There we meet Roderick's mother, Eliza, who's played by Annabeth Gish, who you may remember from Midnight Mass and Haunting of Hill House. She was secretary to William Longfellow, played by Robert Longstreet, who you also might have seen in Midnight Mass and Hill House. William had an affair with Eliza, which resulted in the births of twins Roderick and Madeline. He pretty much disowned the kids and had Eliza raise them on her own, even shunning them when Eliza's health took a turn for the worse. Seeing his mom in so much pain fueled Roderick to pursue a career in medicine, hoping to one day create a product that could ease humanity's suffering. So he ends up getting an entry-level job at the same company that so cruelly treated his mother, Fortunato. Enter Rufus Griswold, the misogynist bastard of a CEO played by Michael Trucco, who you may remember as Wade from Midnight Mass. Not only does he treat Madeline like a piece of meat when she comes to him with a way to computerize the company, but he steals Roderick's painkiller idea, forges documents, and covers up deaths caused by their products. He even goes so far as to dig up corpses of the company's victims so there would be no evidence. So Madeline and Roderick devise a way to get back at Rufus and simultaneously take control of the company. This idea was spurred by their first foster family, the Muldoons. We never meet the Muldoons, but according to Madeline, they were fostering kids just to collect their government checks. So unlike Roderick, who rebelled against them, Madeline made herself useful to the Muldoons, even giving them tips on how to cut more corners. I made myself their favorite of all of the kids. Over time, she gained their trust, which allowed her access to their secret ledgers, which she eventually turned into the police to have them arrested. If they can gain Rufus's trust, it may offer them an opportunity to stab him in the back. Enter young August Dupin, who wants to expose Rufus and Fortunato for their crimes. With Roderick as an informant, they can finally take Fortunato down. But on the day of his deposition, Roderick backstabs Dupin and says he has no knowledge of any wrongdoing. This is all a calculation plan by Roderick and Madeline to get in Rufus's good books. By saving Rufus's and Fortunato's ass, Roderick gets that new promotion, is showered in money, and gets the new office right next to the CEO. This does not go over well with Roderick's first wife, Annabelle Lee, a character named after the famous Poe poem. She's played by Katie Parker, who you may remember as Poppy Hill from The Haunting of Hill House. Rather than do the right thing, her husband has chosen greed, and this decision ultimately has her file for divorce. But Madeline and Roderick's plan doesn't end there. They want Rufus to pay. So Madeline seduces Rufus, not that hard to do since he already tried hitting on her, and she brings him down into the under construction offices to drug and chain him up behind a wall. We'll see that this whole area is still under construction 40 years later, so it looks like when Roderick took over he put a stop to it just in case someone went looking. Wall analogies and metaphors are littered all throughout this series from Pink Floyd's Brick in the Wall playing at the start of episode one to dialogue from our characters. This is about forming a f***ing wall. She's in the walls. That family firewall you've always talked about is being dismantled one brick 
at a time. The plan to bury Rufus behind this wall at New Year's meant the office would be on vacation for an entire week. But not to worry, Madeline said she slipped him enough cyanide that he'll be dead by morning. This is also why Roderick is haunted by a jester, the costume Rufus was wearing the night he was murdered. To provide themselves with an alibi, the two make their way to a local bar, and this is when their lives change forever. There, they meet Verna, an unassuming bartender who turns out to be more than she seems. She somehow knows Madeline and Roderick killed Rufus and offers them a deal. In exchange for a life of luxury and excess, free from any repercussions, they must forfeit their bloodline upon Roderick's death. Any offspring they have will die with them. Into the world together, out of the world together, or there is no deal, that's what she said. And Verna makes a pretty compelling argument here. Would you rather your child live to be 50 to 60 in a life where anything they want they can have, or would you have them live to be 70 or 80 with a life riddled with anxiety and tribulation? At this point, Roderick had already lost his wife and kids to divorce, and Madeline will never have kids, so both of them decide to take this deal. When they leave the bar, it mysteriously vanishes, and the two go go on about their lives, wondering if what they experienced ever even happened. Although the show never explicitly states who or what Verna is, there are several clues that point to her being a malevolent supernatural force. Here are all the facts we know about her. One, she's not human. We see her killed multiple times only to come back completely unscathed. In episode 6, Madeline even grabs her and she turns into black dust. Two, Verna can shapeshift, turning into a chimpanzee, black cat, and of course, of course, Edgar Allan Poe's famous Raven. If you switch around the letters of Verna, you get the word Raven, and her in Raven form can be found all throughout the season, peering down at Roderick outside the funeral and at Dupin atop the ruins of the Usher House, among several other times. As Verna states, the Raven is often a symbol of death, but in some culture, it's a symbol of fortune. Death and fortune is what she brings to the Ushers. 3. Verna can mimic other people's voices. She takes on Frederick's voice to tell the demolition team to start their work. 4. Verna has been around long before humans existed, remarking how she watched as humans first built cities. This ties into her being immortal, or at least old enough to have been around for thousands of years. We'll see Arthur Pym dig up these photos of her from the past century, photos of her with billionaire David Coe, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, and Republican Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. There are a lot more here, but it implies she made deals with all of them, similar to the one she made with Roderick and Madeline. Five, she can mind control her victims, like how she made Frederick put the paralytic drug Nightshade into his own drugs. 6. She can see multiple futures and multiple pasts. While talking to Madeline, she says if Roderick had left Fortunato, he would have gone off to be a poet. She tells Frederick he would have been a dentist, ironic since he pulls out his wife's teeth and she informs Pym of how his life will turn out depending on what he does next. But perhaps the most damning evidence that Verna is some sort of minion of Satan is the line she delivers to Pym. But you're so damn interesting. That's why I had to go topside topside, implying that she comes from below, from hell. She even refers to herself as a, quote, witness of suffering and pain, ironic since Roderick built his life around ending pain, something deep down he knew was a lie that he peddled to the masses. That's the biggest lie we told. You can't eliminate pain. So for 40 plus years, Roderick and Madeline build Fortunato into one of the richest companies in the world. The irony is that Roderick becomes just like the man he hated, Rufus. He's complicit in covering up deaths caused by their medication, exploits his workers, and basically has sex with anyone he chooses, fostering four bastard children. The reason Roderick allows these children all the luxuries and privileges of his legitimate children is that he knows they will die with him too. If you're an usher, the gates are open, period. Roderick even uses the same sayings as his late boss. We are all at f***ing battle stations right now. I am the commanding officer, and I don't want to hear anything out of your mouth that isn't sir, yes sir. We're at battle stations. I'm the commanding officer. I don't want to hear anything but sir. Yes, sir. In episode one, Roderick gets some distressing news from his doctor. We never hear what this diagnosis is until episode four. Roderick has catacil, a form of vascular dementia, and he doesn't have long to live. This is the same inherited disease his mother had. This is why Roderick was so insistent that Victorine's heart mesh device worked. It could potentially lengthen his life and thus the lives of his children. Madeline, on the other hand, took a different approach. She's always been obsessed with immortality 
immortality, collecting rare Egyptian artifacts since the ancient Egyptians believed one's soul could live forever. This is why Roderick buries her alongside items belonging to the famous Queen Tusret of Egypt. These items included the very gems embedded into Tusret's eyes, items that took an extreme amount of money and pull to acquire. It makes me question whether Roderick planned to kill Madeline months in advance. While immortality may not be achievable in spirit form, Madeline thinks it can be done digitally. She's been working on a project that can recreate one's consciousness on a digital cloud, and her first trial subject is her granddaughter Lenore. Edgar Allan Poe used the name Lenore in several of his works, most notably the poem The Raven, in which the narrator mourns the loss of his beloved Lenore. The name evokes a sense of sorrow and tragedy, fitting considering what happens to the character in the show. Lenore's digital consciousness went live upon Lenore's death, and now it incessantly texts Roderick with the word Nevermore, the same word the raven torments the narrator in the poem. With Roderick's death on the horizon, Verna comes to collect Roderick's bloodline. And to make things a little more palatable, each of his children vary on just how evil they are. We have Prospero, who only cares about the success of his pop-up nightclub exclusively for millionaires where no rules apply. He threatens to stab his friend with a fork and plans to have sex with his sister-in-law. He'll die in a tragic acid incident when the sprinklers that go off at his nightclub were found to contain illegal chemicals Fortunato was hiding from inspectors. The next is Camille, whose company makes Fox News look like a saint. She can speak in any information to her will, and this largely entails covering up or downplaying Fortunato's misdeeds. She also treats her assistants like shit and requires them to have sex with her. She dies when one of Victorine's test chimps mauls her to death. Next is Victorine, who engages in illegal animal testing, killing chimps and replacing them with new ones in a feverish attempt to make her heart mesh work. She'll end up going crazy and performing a murder-suicide. Napoleon is the prince of gaming. He cheats on his boyfriend, tries to cover up the death of his cat by replacing it with a new one, and is a notorious drug dealer. He believes the cat has gotten into the walls and eventually chases it over the ledge of his apartment, plummeting to his death. Tamerlane wants to start a health and wellness company when her whole life is anything but healthy and well. She makes her husband perform these weird scenarios with prostitutes, treats them like shit, and tells him she was just using him to get her new company off the ground. It's pretty ironic that a woman obsessed with self-image dies by shards of mirrored glass. Then there's Frederick, who may just be the most messed up of the bunch. To get back at his wife for attending his half-brother's sex party, he keeps her acid-burned body drugged up and away from doctors. To make matters worse, he creepily posts their wedding pictures all over the walls as a reminder reminder of what she did. Frederick has often been considered the toothless son of his father, so it's pretty messed up that he removes the teeth of his wife. He'll end up dying in the very building he sought to destroy, after Verna had him pour scoops of nightshade, a fortune out of paralytic, into his stash of drugs. The only truly innocent victim in the bunch is Lenore. Verna even laments having to kill such a sweet child, and she gets off lightly with a single touch to the forehead. But Lenore's death isn't in vain. Lenore's mother will go on to create the Lenore Foundation for Victims of Abuse, and over the next decade it will save millions of lives. Perhaps the most tragic character is Arthur Pym, the Fortunato lawyer. He has no spouse, friends, or children, fearing those he loved could be leveraged against him. Collateral is leverage. We never really do find out what tragedies befell him on his transglobe expedition. Verna hints that it involved leaving a man in the desert, an injured Inuit guide hit by friendly fire, and a cannibalistic act that Arthur did not partake in. Pym calls humanity a virus. Perhaps he saw the worst of humanity on that expedition, and working for Fortunato certainly wouldn't have opened his eyes to the good humanity can do. My favorite shot of him is when Verna caresses his face. It's almost as if it's the first time he's been touched in decades, and he basks in the moment. Pym will end up being arrested with mountains of evidence collected by Camille's assistants, helping put him away for good. In his defense, he doesn't say a word. The final death is of Roderick Usher himself. Verna shows him piles of bodies raining from the sky, a symbol of the millions of people he and his company have killed, stating that he is in the top five killers throughout all of humanity. It's at this moment that Roderick is instructed to call Dupin, leading us to his confession. There's also this flashback to what I thought was one of the most interesting scenes of dialogue of the series in which Madeline tries to justify her actions. Roderick, Madeline, and Fortunato is not the problem, rather society. Why do we create a political system in which 
women can't make decisions over their own body, a system that turns men into cum fountains and women into factories to provide an impoverished workforce that's sole purpose is to consume. We teach people to want houses they can't afford, cars that poison the air, and products created by starving children in third world countries. Why then are we the bad guys? It's a speech that attempts to exonerate any of her culpability in a company that's killed millions. It's kind of like a drug dealer saying, hey, you can't blame me for that overdose, I didn't put the drugs in their system. And as she finishes this big speech, it's Roderick who ends up drugging and killing her. A complete reversal from the second last episode where Madeline told Roderick the only way to save themselves was if he killed himself, and it's pretty ironic that he does this by overdosing on his own drug. Roderick prepares her body like the Egyptian Queen Tusret. After Roderick's confession, the house begins to shake and crumble, but not before Madeline appears and chokes Roderick to death, just like his mother Eliza came back and choked their father to death. It's left up to the viewer on whether or not these are their resurrected corpses or whether they were even dead in the first place. I like to think more of the supernatural. The house collapses, leaving a shock Dupin with a fleeting image of Verna above the rubble. It is the literal fall of the House of Usher. Dupin retires, putting away that corkboard which was once filled with everything to do with the Ushers. Juno, Roderick's wife, weans herself off Ligodone and starts her own rehab association. You might think it's odd that a man who spent most of his life trying to bring down the Ushers leaves Roderick's confession, but in all honesty, what good is it going to do? It's not going to bring anyone back. Anyone in the Usher family who did something bad is dead or in jail. As Dupin says, now is the time to heal. Dupin leaves stating that he's the richest man in the world. Not rich in terms of wealth, but the love of his family. Something Annabelle Lee told Roderick he did not have. I look at you and I see the poverty of you. Verna ends up placing mementos on the graves of the Usher family, each one symbolizing an aspect of their life. A mask for Prospero, a phone for Camille, cat collar for Napoleon, the heart mesh for Victorine, the gold bug scarab for Tammy, drugs for Frederick, a raven feather with white rose for Lenore, Tusret's gems for Madeline, and a whiskey glass for Roderick. Verna did say that the million dollar whiskey he enjoys in front of Dupin should only be drunk on two occasions, on the best day of your life or your last day on earth. And that's certainly true for Roderick. As the camera focuses on Verna in funeral attire, we cut to a wide shot and Verna is not there. She's been replaced by a raven who ushers toward the camera. Thus ends the fall of the House of Usher, a tragic tale about greed, corruption, love, and loss. Loss. I really enjoyed this series and would put it slightly behind Hill House and Midnight Mass in my list of Flanagan series. But now I want to hear what you thought about Usher. Leave your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember Tina! Name isn't Tina, you know that my name is Beth. I don't give a shit, Beth!